Hi, welcome to Pathways to Chemistry. This is Dr. O'Connor, and today we're going to take a look at molecular shapes. So we're going to talk a little bit about electron pair geometry and molecular geometries. So let's take a look at this molecule here. This is boron trifluoride, and here we have the Lewis structure of boron trifluoride. So what is the shape of this molecule? Remember, molecules are three-dimensional. And we're so used to working with them on paper in two-dimensional space. But we do have to remember that they are three-dimensional. So before we go any further, um, let's take a look at this uh, boron trifluoride. And there are several possible uh, geometries for this particular species. Um, you know, is it uh, what we would call a T-shape, a trigonal planar? Or a trigonal pyramidal. Go ahead and talk about how we determine molecular shape. The Lewis structure only gives us information about how the atoms are connected and how the electron pairs are distributed about each atom. So we know that boron trifluoride contains a total of six valence electrons that exist as three boron fluoride single bonds. Now, each boron fluoride bond represents two valence electrons that are being shared. One of the electrons is provided by the boron, and the other one by a fluorine atom. So, let's go ahead and think about the bonds and the lone pairs that surround the central atom as clouds of negative charge, or charge clouds, if you will. Now, boron here has three charge clouds. It has three bonds. Now, charge clouds can be a single bond. That is equivalent to one charge cloud. A double bond is also equivalent to one cloud of charge. A triple bond is equivalent to one charge cloud. And a lone pair is also equivalent to one charge cloud. So again, a single charge cloud can be the result of a single bond, a double bond, a triple bond, or a lone pair. So when we determine electron pair geometry, we only consider the charge clouds that surround the central atom. So let's take a look at this. How many charge clouds are surrounding the central atom in the following molecules? Well, here we have one, two, Three. So there are three charge clouds. How about this one? Again, remember, we're only looking at the central atom. We have one, two charge clouds. And then here, about the nitrogen, we have one, two, three. And remember, a lone pair is also considered a charge cloud. Charge clouds around the central atom will orient themselves as far away from one another as possible, and that's what gives rise to the different molecular shapes. When we refer to the arrangements of only the charge clouds about the central atom, we call that the electron pair geometry. When we refer to the arrangement of only the atoms about the central atom, we call that the molecular geometry. Again, this refers only to the position or positions of the atoms and not the lone pairs of electrons. So let's take a look again at our boron trifluoride. It turns out that the electron pair geometry for boron trifluoride is trigonal planar. And it also works out that the molecular geometry is also trigonal planar. In this case, the molecular and the electron pair geometries are the same, but we're going to see cases where they can be different. Note, we have a central atom bonded to three atoms, and there are no lone pairs about that central atom. So in the case where you don't have lone pairs around the central atom, then usually the electron pair geometry is the same as the molecular geometry. So let's go ahead and compare boron trifluoride with sulfur dioxide. We have the Lewis structure for both 
of these compounds. And so each one of these is surrounded by three charge clouds. The boron atom, the charge clouds are actually the, um, the bonds, okay, between the uh, boron and the fluorine atoms. Now for the sulfur dioxide, there are three charge clouds, but one of those charge clouds is due to a lone pair of electrons. Well, the electron pair geometry for sulfur dioxide is trigonal planar, but the molecular geometry is not, and that's because of this lone pair of electrons. For boron trifluoride, again, both the molecular and the electron pair geometries are trigonal planar. For sulfur dioxide, the electron pair geometry is trigonal planar, and the molecular geometry is bent. Here are a few abbreviations that we're going to be using during this video and also in class. You can take a look at these in your book. They are listed. How do we determine electron pair geometries and molecular geometries? Well, here's a table, and it's quite long, and we'll go through each situation. In the event where we have a central atom surrounded by two atoms, then what we have is a linear geometry. Remember what we said that the charge clouds will orient themselves as far away from one another as possible. That's more stable. So in this case here, when you have a central atom bonded to two atoms, then that angle must be 180 degrees. So what we have is we have a linear electron pair geometry, and the molecular geometry will also be linear because there are no lone pairs about the central atom. Let's take a look at a trigonal planar. A trigonal planar, remember here we have three bonds about a central atom, and they will orient themselves as far away from one another as possible. So these bond angles must be 120 degrees. When we have a central atom surrounded by three atoms, then what we have is an electron pair geometry that is trigonal planar, and if there are three atoms bonded to that central atom and no lone pairs, then the molecular geometry is also trigonal planar. Let's take a look at this. We have three charge clouds, so the electron pair geometry is trigonal planar, but we have the case where there are two bonds, so two atoms are bonded to the nitrogen and one pair of electrons. So in this case here, you don't have a trigonal planar as far as the molecular geometry. The reason why is because the lone pair of electrons take a lot more room than the bonding electrons, and that's because the lone pair is only under the influence of one nucleus, in this case the nitrogen where the bonded atoms are under the influence of two nuclei, in this case both the nitrogen and the oxygen, so they're held more tightly. The lone pair then, it takes up more room and therefore compresses the rest of the molecule. So these angles now are not 120 degrees, but actually less than 120 degrees. So that gives rise to a molecular geometry, which we call a bent geometry. Now, let's go to the situation where we have a central atom bonded to four atoms, or let's say a central atom surrounded by four charge clouds. In that case, then, the electron pair geometry is tetrahedral. And all three of these examples have four charge clouds around the central atom. So the electron pair geometry is tetrahedral. Now, if there are no lone pair, and again, just four atoms bonded to that central atom, then the molecular geometry is also tetrahedral. Now, what about the case like with ammonia, where we have three atoms bonded to the central atom and one lone pair? Well, in this case, what we're going to have is a trigonal pyramidal. 
Let's go back here for a moment. When we have four atoms bonded to a central atom, these bond angles are 109.5 degrees. Now, in the case of ammonia, again, remember, we have that lone pair of electrons. So now we don't have those ideal bond angles of 109.5 degrees. They're actually 107 degrees. So that gives rise to a trigonal pyramidal molecular geometry. Now, what about a situation where we have a tetrahedral electron pair geometry, but two of those charge clouds are lone pairs? Well, in the case of water, we see that. And again, now two lone pairs are going to compress this bond angle even more. So it's going to be less than 109.5. Actually, for a bent molecular geometry, the bond angle here is 104.5 degrees. So when you have a tetrahedral electron pair geometry, and we have a central atom bonded to two atoms and two lone pairs surrounding about it, we have a bent geometry. Let's go here to a situation where we have a central atom bonded to five atoms or a central atom surrounded by five charge clouds. What we have is a trigonal bipyramidal electron pair geometry. And if there are no lone pairs, and again, the central atom is bonded to five atoms, then the molecular geometry is also trigonal pyramidal. Now, in the case where we have four atoms and one lone pair, the molecular geometry is a seesaw shape. When we have three bonds and two lone pairs, we have a T shape. And two bonds and three lone pairs give us a linear. So we're right back to linear here. One more electron pair geometry that we need to look at is an octahedral electron pair geometry. This is where we have a central atom bonded to six atoms. Or as far as the electron pair geometry, a central atom with six charge clouds. If those charge clouds are all bonds, then the molecular geometry is also octahedral. If we have five bonds and one lone pair, then we have a square pyramidal molecular geometry. And if there are four bonds and two lone pairs, we have a square planar geometry. Let's do an example. Today we're going to look at the Lewis structure of iodide tetrachloride which is a polyatomic ion. And we're going to determine the number of charge clouds that surround the central atom. And then from there, we're going to look at the number of bonding atoms and the number of lone pairs about the iodine. From that, we can determine both the electron pair geometry and the molecular geometry. Okay, so that's our goal. So let's first start with the Lewis structure. So what we have is, we have this structure here, or this um, molecular formula here. So let's count up the number of valence electrons. So we have seven for iodine and seven for chlorine, but there are four chlorines. So that's going to be seven times five is 35 electrons plus one electron for that negative charge, okay? So that's a total of 36 electrons. It tells us that iodine is our central atom. So let's go ahead and draw that in. And I'll draw in the bonds and then the chlorines. OK. So let's go ahead and get the uh, electron pairs around the chlorines. and. Again, we always take care of the peripheral atoms first, make sure they have their octet, and then if we have leftover electrons, we place those pairs on the central atom. So in this case here, we have 32 electrons accounted for. So we have four electrons left. So I'm going to place the lone pairs on the central atom here. And let me go ahead and 
and draw that in. Okay, so how many charge clouds surround the central atom? Remember, charge clouds are the lone pairs and the bonds. So in this case here, we have four bonds plus two lone pairs. So we have six charge clouds. Um, let's, so we, let's go ahead and write out that we have the four atoms bonded to the iodine, and we have two lone pairs on that iodine, so two lone pairs. So now we want to determine the electron pair geometry. Well, we have six charge clouds here. So we go down to our chart here, and we see that when we have six charge clouds, okay, um, we have an octahedral geometry. So the electron pair geometry would be octahedral. But the molecular geometry, now we have to take into account the number of bonds and the number of lone pairs. So we have four atoms bonded to the iodine and two lone pairs. So let me go down here. So here we have the four atoms bonded, two lone pairs. So our molecular geometry then for this particular species would be square planar. So let me write that in, square planar.